Welcome back, everyone. Dr. TEMD here, back at you with another thrilling, heart racing, eloquent episode of MRI Physics Explained. Today, we will be continuing our journey as MRI pioneers, focusing on signal localization along the X dimension in a slice. If you didn't see the prior lecture on slice selection, click the link above to brush up. And if you like these lectures, please subscribe, like, and comment to support the channel, follow us on Instagram or consider donating using the links below. With that said, let's get to it. In the previous lecture, we figured out a way to energize only a slice of the body with our RF pulse using a slice select gradient. We did this by adding an electromagnet at both the head and feet of the patient, running a reverse current through one and a forward current in the other, which created a linearly varying magnetic field from head to toe and thus linearly varying Larmar frequency via the formula below. Sounds poetic, doesn't it? We then simply needed to tune our radio frequency pulse to the Larmar frequency corresponding to our slice of interest, energizing only that slice within the body, and ensuring our receiver coil slash antenna will only record signal coming from that slice. So now we have to develop a way to locate the signal coming from a single row within that slice. In our case, along the x-axis. Let's first introduce a term common in radiology but uncommon elsewhere, a voxel, which is a fancy term for a three-dimensional pixel because there's a thickness associated to each of these pixels, thus voxel. While a real MRI slice contains hundreds of voxels within each row and column of a slice, there's no need to overcomplicate things. Whatever method we develop here can be expanded to bigger and bigger matrices. So to start, let's pretend we have a two voxel slice changing only along the x-axis. Let's say one voxel contains pure CSF and the other voxel contains pure fat. The magnetic field these two voxels will experience is B0. Or if the slice select gradient is on, B0 plus or minus the applied gradient field. Either way, it will be constant across the slice. We've done nothing to change the magnetic field in the X or Y dimension so far. So if we turn on our slice select gradients and apply our radio frequency electromagnetic pulse to energize this slice, our MRI machine will capture a raw signal that looks like this. Now some of you might say, wait a second, Dr. TE. You said the MRI machine records a complex looking T2 decay curve. And this looks suspiciously simple. Well, let's see why. We know the raw signal our machine records will be whatever the signal coming from the voxel containing CSF is, plus the voxel containing fat. So what is the Larmar frequency of the voxel containing CSF? The gyromagnetic ratio times the magnetic field, in this case B0. This will produce a T2 decay curve that looks like this. And what is the Larmar frequency of the voxel containing fat? It's also experiencing a magnetic field of B0, so it will produce a very similar looking T2 decay curve with the exact same frequency as the CSF voxel, only differing in amplitude. Since they are the same frequency, our raw recorded signal will also have the same frequency, with the amplitude being that of the CSF voxel plus fat voxel. To prove this point, I drew a line spanning one wavelength on the raw MR signal, and you can see if we move it over, it matches the same wavelength as the CSF and fat voxels. Furthermore, if I draw a line representing an amplitude on each T2 decay curve, these truly do simply add together to give us the amplitude of our raw MR signal. But remember, the MRI machine can't see these individual T2 decay curves we can only record this sum total raw signal. And as it stands, we don't know the individual components making these amplitudes. It could be this, or this, or even this. You get the idea. So in this situation, we can't build a contrasted picture because we have no way of knowing what the amplitude is of the T2 decay curve coming from either the CSF or fat voxel. To figure out how to proceed, perhaps a better question is, what can we change? Let's go back to the math that governs all of this, the Larmar frequency. 
Can we change the gyromagnetic ratio? No, it's a constant, right? What about the magnetic field? What if we borrowed the idea we developed in the slice selection lecture and place electromagnets on the far edges of the x-axis? Let's run a forward current through one coil and a reverse current through the other. How would this change the magnetic field the voxels experience? We'd get a linearly varying magnetic field from left to right along the x-axis, right? It's the same principle we developed for the slice selection method, but we've already excited the slice at this point. The protons in our slice are already spinning, generating signal in our receiver coils, so we don't need another RF pulse. What happens if we simply turn these magnets on after slice selection and look at the signal? We get a much more complex looking signal now, and why is that? Well, we've changed the magnetic field across the slice, so our CSF voxel will experience a different magnetic field than our fat voxel, and will therefore precess at a different Larmor frequency than the protons in our fat voxel. Our CSF voxel will then have a T2 decay curve that looks like this. And our fat T2 decay curve will then look like this. Notice that they now have different frequencies, and when added together, they give us a much more complex looking raw signal. We have just encoded spatial information along the x-axis through differences in frequency. We can't physically see those individual T2 decay curves, but we know they are there, buried somewhere within this raw signal. And here's where the magic happens. We actually do have a way to retrieve those individual T2 decay curves from this complex raw signal. We have this mathematical tool called the Fourier transform, which uses harmonic analysis to figure out what individual simple frequencies can be added together to make up a complex repeating curve, in this case our raw MR signal. And in the future we'll have a whole lecture on Fourier transforms because they're that critical to understanding MRI physics as well as making the modern world we live in today function. But for the purpose of these basic lectures, just know that it's a mathematical tool and we'll use it to identify simple frequencies from a complex signal. So with this tool, we're now able to identify signal coming from each voxel. We can then select a time point to compare the signals, TE, calculate the corresponding amplitude of each signal at that time point, and correctly place it within the appropriate voxel because we know the frequencies will go from low to high in a left to right direction. So whatever T2 decay curve has the lower of the frequencies must be the voxel on the left. But as we will see in our next lecture, this gets much more complicated when adding another dimension. And one final point. Just like our slice select gradient, when we apply our frequency encoding gradient, we can't perfectly fit a single frequency to a single voxel. There will always be a range of frequencies within that voxel. And therefore, when analyzing the frequencies coming from our recorded signal, we need to select a range of frequencies to look for. This range of frequencies we pick is called the receiver bandwidth. So we have a transmit bandwidth and we have a receiver bandwidth, and both of these will affect image quality. So we've done it. We're two thirds of the way there, everyone. We've successfully developed a method of identifying the location and signal coming from individual voxels along the x axis by encoding each one with a unique frequency. This leaves us one final task, and the hardest of all, signal localization along the y-axis. And that's all. Here are the ways to support the channel, images used for this lecture, a disclaimer on the images and animations, and we'll see you next time. This is Dr. T.E. signing off.